bringing hope to many around the globe, transforming lives into legacies. Live in Word with Pastor Mensah Otterville. And now, today's word. I'm doing part two of my message, The Power of Words. The Power of Words. Our words have got power. And we have to learn to harness that power positively instead of letting it work against us negatively. Last week we looked at the fact that God uses words and he uses words to create and he uses words to name what he has created. He said, let there be, and then he called what he had declared to be. God uses words to bring things into existence and he uses words to call to name what he has made. And we realize also that God brought the animals before Adam and he said that whatever he named them, that was their name. In other words, God brings things our way. He brings things our way and whatever we name them, that will be the name. So the question you have to ask yourself is what names am I calling the things that come my way. You cannot determine everything that comes your way, but you determine how you will call them. And so today we'll go a bit further to understand the power of words. Let's start with Matthew's Gospel, chapter 8, verses 5 to 10, and then we will read verse 13. And we read these words. Now when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him pleading with him, saying, Lord, my servant is lying at home paralyzed, dreadfully tormented. Jesus said to him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. For I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. To my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. Then verse 13. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go your way. And as you have believed, so let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that same hour. This meeting between Jesus and the centurion was very remarkable for several reasons. Because he was not a Jew. He was a Roman centurion. And by the covenant between God and Israel, he was not entitled to the covenant blessing of God. This centurion was not really interested in Jesus physically being where the problem was. It's very interesting that when you read the ministry of Jesus, everybody wanted him to be present where he was. Uh, they needed him on the scene. They would go to call for him to be present physically. This is the only person who was not interested in the physical presence of Jesus for a miracle to be effected. So he told Jesus to send his word and not his person. And the remark of Jesus uh, was, was very important because Jesus is telling us what this man did was how we should operate. And so he recommends the centurion's understanding and method to us. And there are a couple of things that I want to 
draw your attention to that we can draw from this passage. The first is that words carry the authority of the speaker. Words carry the authority of the speaker. Note how the centurion describes himself. I am a man of authority. I am a man of authority. A man of authority speaks with authority. He speaks very sure that there is weight in what he is saying. A person with a low level of authority speaks also with low level of authority. You can tell whether a person is an authority or not by how they speak. People with authority usually will say one thing or issue a command and they expect it to be obeyed. And people with little authority will say it many, many times. Uh, the man says, I'm a man of authority. I say to this one, go. He didn't say, I say to this one, go, 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 go. He said, I just say it once and it happens. Now, this may not be the best example, but most people would know that uh, in a home where there is a father and a mother, mothers normally speak a lot and fathers speak once. A mother would tell the child, have your bath, have your bath, have your bath, have your bath, have your bath. And the child will joke and play and argue until daddy comes and says, hey. And they go and have their bath. Because there are different levels of authority. The more you repeat yourself in an instruction, the less authority you are manifesting. And the more you rely on the original instruction to work, the more conscious you are of your authority. It's not about how many words you speak. It's about how much power your words carry. So this man says that I am an, a man of authority. I don't keep repeating my words. I say to this one, go. And he goes, come. He comes. Do this. He does it. Words carry the authority of the speaker. The second thing you would notice that what a person can do, his words can also do. The centurion saw his words as an extension of himself. He saw his words as capable of doing what he can do. And that's a very important uh, observation. So the centurion's logic was very simple. I am a commander, so my words command. You are a healer, so your words should heal. That's what he's telling Jesus. I am a commander, my words command. You are a healer, your words must heal. What you can do, your words can do. What I can do, my words can do. Isn't it interesting that almost everything I do in my life, and almost everything you do in your life, you do with words. I am a pastor. How do I pastor? With words. I'm doing it right now. When people come to see me in the office, I counsel them with words. When I have to go and pray for somebody, I use words. When I have to encourage somebody, I use words. Whatever God has called me to do is manifested with my words. What I can do, my words can do. If you don't receive my words, then you don't receive me. In the same way, this centurion is saying, what my words can do, or what I can do as a commander, my words can also do. Words are very powerful. They do what you can do. The third thing is that you note from the passage is that words are messengers sent on a mission. First is that words carry the authority of the speaker. Second, what a person can do, his or her words can do. Third, words are messengers sent on a mission. The centurion saw his words as his messengers. They move with his instructions to do what he wants to get done. When he says, go to his servants, that sound carried a mission. And those who received the sound 
also receive the mission to go. Words are like medicine or capsules. These days when you say tablets, it can be many things, but I mean uh, medical tablets. A fever reducer carries within itself fever reducing capacity. A painkiller carries within itself painkilling ability. So when you take uh, that tablet and you swallow it, it may look whitish like chalk, but you haven't swallowed chalk. What you have swallowed is a painkilling career. So that tablet carries the ability and it targets wherever the pain is and within a few minutes, all things being equal, your pain subsides. Why? Because the tablet is a career of power. Some tablets actually carry more than one power, especially the Ghanaian, uh, <laughs> the one they sell on the buses. It can heal you from A to Z. Uh, it can heal, uh, normally they start with impotence and then headache and then, uh, you know, I don't know why they start with that. <laughs> they assume people have issues. You know, but, but one tablet can, it can, it can heal your toes, it can heal your heels, it can heal your stomach, it can heal uh, your neck, it can heal your arm, it will make you have twins and, and, and it, <laughs> Normally, it, it, it doesn't work that way. But there are tablets uh, that have multiple capacity. They sent on a mission and they do several things at the same time. And, and, and they reduce fever, they take away the pain and you stop the cough and so on and so forth. So different things are happening at the same time. In the same way, words sometimes don't carry only one mission or one instruction. Sometimes it carries multiple instructions. And just one word will accomplish about four, five, six different things. For example, when Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come forth. It's just, come forth is just two words. Come forth. I mean, apparently, uh, it, it seemed like it's only one instruction. But for Lazarus to come forth, permission must be given for his spirit to be released from wherever it was to him. So, comfort addresses God. Let his soul come back to him. Comfort brings his soul from wherever it is to his body. Comfort means his body which has been decomposed is recomposed. Comfort means that which killed him must be healed. Otherwise, he will rise up and die immediately. Comfort means he should be able to move from the tomb and get out. One word accomplishing different things at the same time. So sometimes words can do multiple things at the same time. And, and, and words sent as messengers may do or may accomplish more than one purpose. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 10 to 11. This is how God himself describes his word. He says, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void. But it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Now, the, God is using something we all know. He says, when the rain comes, and the snow, which we can't relate to because we are not a snow country. Uh, so let's take the rain. Except you've traveled to temperate regions, then you can say snow, but... In Ghana, we don't have snow. The day snows in Ghana. We have to cry to Jehovah. Because we can't even handle drizzle. The day snows, half of the population will need help. Extreme help. Right. So, when it rains, the rain comes from above, from the clouds above. 
the rains carry something. They carry all kinds of properties. And then the rain comes to the ground. When it comes to the ground, it releases every property it has within it to the ground. And then when it releases it to the ground, it nourishes the ground. The ground gets the nourishment, gives it to the plant, and the plant flourishes. So, so, so the word is saying that that rain carries something within it. And when it is sent, until it accomplishes that purpose, its mission has not been accomplished. So, so the rain would not be coming. You know, it's released from the clouds and it's just coming, 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 coming. coming. Oh, I don't want to go down again. I'll go, 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 go up. Have you seen rain that does that? Maybe your country or your village. It rains like that. The rain is coming down, coming, 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 coming down. It reaches something. So, oh, I'm going up again now. The rain doesn't do that. The rain comes, 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 and hits the ground. And when it hits the ground, it doesn't just die. Or it doesn't just lose its power. When it hits the ground, it starts a new process. And the, and the passage is saying that that rain was sent on a mission and it accomplishes the mission. And then God uses that as an analogy to talk about his word. He says, when I send my word, my word is packaged with something in it. And when I send it to you, it will never return void until it has accomplished the purpose for which it is sent. So every word of God is on a mission. Every word of God is on a mission. On a mission with a target. And when it hits the target, it will accomplish the purpose for which the word was sent. Just like the painkiller would accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. And just like the fever reducer will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. Just like the cough suppressant will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. So the word of God released into your life will accomplish the purpose for which it was sent. So if God says, I love you, that word has a purpose in your life. When God says, I bless you. That word has a purpose in your life. And that word will go to the target where it has been sent and download or offload the package that it is carrying within it. So anytime we take in the word of God or anytime we receive the word of God, we are receiving tablets of God's purposes released towards us. Now, what do we do then when God's word comes to us? Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16, uh, gives us a clue as to what to do. When God's word is released into our lives, what should we do with it? Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16 says, Your words were found, and I ate them. And your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. So God has sent his word. What should we do with the word? Definitely, uh, when, when you take in uh, a tablet, and I don't understand all the medical processes, but... When you're taking a tablet, it has to be broken somewhere in your stomach and it has to be absorbed through a process into your bloodstream and it has to go to where the pain is. So, so there has to be something that takes in the tablet and distributes it. So when God's word comes to us, what process must it go through? Now Jeremiah says that when God's word comes to us, we must eat it. He says, God's word out of his mouth must be eaten by us. Once a word comes out of God's mouth, we must eat it.
Thank you for listening to Living Word. To interact with Pastor Mensah Otebil, like his page on Facebook. Follow him on Twitter at Mensah Otebil. Email otebil at centralgospel.com or call plus 233-302-688-000.